Our next speaker, Catherine Machalaba. Uh, she is the program coordinator for health and policy at the EcoHealth Alliance. The Alliance is based in New York City and is dedicated to the conservation of biodiversity internationally. It undertakes innovative research on the intricate relationships between wildlife, ecosystems, and human health. Uh, we were very glad that Catherine and uh, some of her colleagues at the Alliance, uh, Elizabeth Lowe, Peter Daszak, and William Karesh, uh, agreed to contribute a chapter to this book, um, Chapter 8, Emerging Diseases from Animals. So Catherine will now um, tell us about that. Uh, she has about 20 minutes, and like with Gary, we will follow that with a Q&A. Okay, go ahead, Catherine. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you to Gary and the World Watch team for having us. We were really thrilled to contribute to this uh, to this book because this is a topic that really has a lot of uh, strong links to environment and uh, sustainability, but doesn't always get appreciated. Um, so I'm very excited to be talking about emerging diseases from animals because I think this is a global health concern, but we can work closely between the public health and environment communities to find sustainable solutions. So I'd like to take you through the scope of the problem and then also focus on so some solutions. So to start, I'd like to pose the question, are we in a new age of emerging diseases? So we've seen a lot of recent emerging diseases in past years, certainly the current Ebola crisis, which I'll talk about later, but also SARS, Nipah virus, MERS, avian influenzas. Um, and if we think back to 2003 with SARS, this is a coronavirus, a respiratory illness, um, and it caused a lot of fear, about 9,000 cases, 900 deaths globally, spread very rapidly, um, and you know created a lot of concern and societal disruption. It shut down markets in China and was initially thought to be spread through a cat-like animal called a civet. Um, our work showed that it was actually sourced from a bat, the horseshoe bat, uh, but there was a lot of concern and the full story didn't become clear until you know a considerable uh, amount of research went into it. Um, we're also seeing, in addition to human outbreaks, um, emerging diseases in wildlife. And I'd like to talk about white nose syndrome because this is causing major declines of bats in the, the past five, 10 years in the United States, um, up to 99% uh, colony uh, losses in certain caves. And this is important to human health because of the ecosystem services that bats provide. So in the US, we've seen projections that uh, 3 billion to 53 billion um, dollars uh, are contribute, you know, directly contributed through uh, ecosystem services that bats provide to agriculture through um, their eating of insects. So they provide a really valuable service that helps with our food security, as you know, Gary highlighted, is is so important. Um, and we're seeing these die-offs of bats from emerging diseases. But this isn't really a new phenomenon. So we've seen these human-animal links. So some um, ancient viruses, such as rabies virus, um, and then some more new viruses too. But in fact, these make up the majority of the known human infectious agents. Um, and they result in over 1 billion human cases every year and millions of human deaths. So most emerging infectious diseases, diseases are zoonotic, so this means they're shared with animals. And I'd also like to point out that this isn't a, a you know, one directional route of transmission. Actually, humans can transmit diseases to animals, and that's quite um, potentially severe for biodiversity loss. Um, we also know that the majority of emerging human pathogens, so those seen within the past 60 years, have originated in wildlife. So it seems like this is a wildlife problem, but I'm here to say that actually this is a human problem because we're causing that disease emergence, our anthropogenic practices. Um, and we're seeing different stages of diseases. So endemic, you know, where it's been established, so now HIV AIDS, this actually came from chimpanzees, the butchering, the hunting of chimpanzees, um, and now it's become endemic in many regions and a global health burden. And then emerging diseases, so they seem to, you know, kind of uh, be sporadic and then they'll 
um, cause you know a, a lot of uh, a major disruption through an outbreak, but then fortunately a lot kind of go under the radar. Um, but this can change, and as we've seen from the current Ebola outbreak in West Africa, this has endured for almost a year and a half. This is by far the largest running Ebola <laughs> outbreak ever. So it's it's not um, a set stage. It can really be dynamic. You know how these diseases uh, the, their trajectory. Um, this is very concerning because the rate of disease emergence appears to be increasing. So certainly our detection tools are improving, but we're actually um, suspecting that disease emergence itself is increasing. So this is a challenge currently and for the future. Um, and it's a really complex process. So, oh, sorry. So we have many different factors here. Um, so we have ecological factors, species composition. So when you go in and cut down a rainforest, um, you're changing the species and their relative abundance. This change in transmission factors, climate change, um, extreme weather, and then the, the type of uh, uh, habitat and landscape and the gradients between them, those all play into these complex uh, dynamics for emerging diseases. And then also evolutionary factors. So a microbe, you know, it wants to survive. So it'll adapt, it'll evolve uh, to be more pathogenic and create a new niche with a new host where it has the opportunity. So it's these opportunities that humans are creating uh, that facilitate disease emergence. And then certainly transmission factors. And I think this is really tangible for you know, our human society, because this is where we uh, create these risks of transmission, uh, but we can also intervene. So we can um, implement practices that reduce risks, and we need to bring all these different disciplines, so ecology, evolution, public health, anthropology, to see the full picture. And I think I... Having some trouble with the slides. Uh, they here? Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so just to take you through visually what these disease outbreaks look like, so their origins. So if we see this curve on the bottom, this green curve, we see these natural transmission cycles in wildlife. Um, so, so for example, with SARS, you know, this is maintained in its natural reservoir, the horseshoe bat. Um, and it doesn't usually cause clinical symptoms. So it can kind of uh, go under the radar in these species, but then something will cause it to have a spillover event. So, you know, there may be an increase in transmission, um, you know, to another species, it'll spill over, and then that may enable uh, more frequent contact with an infected animal. So if you have a, an intermediary host here, we see domestic animals, and they may be more competent hosts that can transmit it to humans. Um, unfortunately, what we currently see is the detection once it's in humans and um, may have amplified in humans. So as we saw with SARS, um, a human was infected and it spread rapidly within the human population. So we're currently detecting these outbreaks uh, downstream, you know, many days into the outbreak rather than upstream uh, before those initial spillover events occur. So where do we start to confront these uh, emerging diseases? So we actually uh, are able to predict where disease emergence can occur. So in 2008, our colleagues set out to map these hot spots of emerging diseases. So the red here, uh, which is mostly centered in the tropics, these are these biodiversity rich, um, typically public health capacity poor regions. And there's also a lot of global change occurring in these regions. Um, so we can expect more emerging disease events in the, the coming years. Um, and these models have been refined, um, and, and actually you can now kind of project down to the five kilometer scale. So they're becoming more precise as we gain more, uh, more inputs. And we're learning about the why of emerging diseases. So what practices in particular are causing these diseases to emerge? Um, and we're seeing that it's, you know, uh, behaviors like, or trends like deforestation, very intensive agriculture, bushmeat hunting, um, the trade of animals, so wet markets, you have many species together, often in close quarters, some novel interactions, some species that you've never had together, and this allows for pathogen pollution and spillover and potentially infection of humans. You know, humans are um, purchasing these wildlife for pets, for food, so there's a lot of different pathways that transmission can occur. And if we look more closely at these drivers of emerging diseases, we see that they're actually shared with the leading causes of biodiversity loss. So 
land use changes, habitat loss, overexploitation of wildlife, bushmeat hunting, uh, and very uh, you know complex um, trends such as climate and weather. So we can actually you know look at working together with the biodiversity community to confront these dual challenges. And I'd like to focus on uh, the global demand for food because this is a real source of problem for emerging diseases. So we've seen several livestock revolutions to meet our growing demand for protein globally. And this has really fundamentally changed the way we produce food. So we see wide scale intensification uh, of food production. And this has involved typically high stocking rates, um, you know, mixing of flocks and species, typically inadequate biosecurity infrastructure that hasn't kept pace with uh, these new agricultural approaches. And um, we saw this specifically for H5N1 when you had, in 2003, um, mixing of species, a lot of really intensive poultry farming, also potentially you know, mixing with um, wild birds, which are the natural res reservoir, and an evolution of the, the strain from a low pathogenic one to a highly pathogenic one that then affected human health and um, you know, is an ongoing concern. We see avian influenza this year. And, um, and also Nipah virus emergence in Malaysia in 1999, we saw conversion of pristine habitat to poultry farms. Um, there was mixing of uh, the flying fox fat that carries the pathogen, uh, the Nipah virus, and um, the, the very intense pig farming. This allowed for transmission from the bats to the pigs, actually through a shared food source. So they had fruit trees on the plantation, um, and then spread of Nipah virus in the pigs, and then directly to the handlers. Uh, this resulted in over uh, 1 million uh, killings of the pigs, so really important for their food industry, and also over 100 cases, human cases, um, so really severe for public health. And then foodborne zoonoses directly that, you know, were at risk of, so food security. Um, livestock production chains allow for very rapid spread of, say, salmonella, and you have uh, this transmitted directly to humans through our food supply. And then also, so not just livestock, domestic animals, but also wild animals. And in certain parts of the world, there's a very high dependence on wildlife for food security, um, but this can lead to very uh, high risk for emerging diseases, as we saw for HIV, uh, AIDS, SARS, and Ebola. And just to give a stat on that, in Central Africa alone, over 1 billion kilograms of bush meat, so wildlife meat, is consumed each year uh, for, for food. And then um, antimicrobial drug resistance. So this is typically you know, thought of as a clinical medicine challenge. And that's certainly uh, a concern for public health. But in fact, two, three-fourths, actually, of our um, clinic, of our antibiotics in the United States are going towards food animal production. So really um, significantly an animal problem as well that poses health risks. And this use in food animal production is expected to increase significantly in the next 15 years. Um, and this isn't just for treating sick animals. This is also for prophylactic prevention of disease and also growth promotion. Um, so this is going into their food. And what happens with antibiotic resistance is you introduce an antibiotic. It kills off you know, most of the bad bacteria, but also a lot of the good bacteria, that commensal bacteria that protects us from disease. And then this allows the, the bad bacteria to multiply and uh, result in re resistant strains. And then these animals, which have these strains, you know, through their waste, um, excrete these, these resistant strains. It gets into our foods, food sources, our water sources. Um, and the antibiotics are often typically unmetabolized as well and will also be disseminated and potentially end up in our households. Um, it's really unclear how animal use of antibiotics translates directly to human health and susceptibility and what the potential is for reversal once it happens, but it's a trend for the future that we're really concerned about. And also extractive industries. So our, our co-speakers will talk a lot about this, but um, it's a big concern for public health, especially in terms of emerging diseases. So these are industries such as extraction for timber, oil and gas, 
mining, uh, palm oil plantations and others, and they create very profound ecological changes. So we'll see installation of roads and other corridors in, you know, uh, typically pristine habitat, which is, you know, often biodiversity uh, rich and public health infrastructure poor. We see um, increase in hunting because typically the uh, employers don't provide a food source and you're out in the, the very remote settings and you know there's, there's food security issues. Um, unfortunately, health risk assessments for local communities are not typically uh, employed before these development projects are approved. So you will have typically environmental and social impact risk assess assessments, but the health impacts typically get left out. So we're not able to assess this risk upfront. So to recap, with development, we're seeing global pressures that are placing more intensified use on our natural resources and bringing us into closer contact with wildlife. And this is enabling the potential for spread, which is compounded because you know we have this global trade and travel. We can uh, travel from DC and you know end up across the globe within 24 hours, and likewise, people and the pathogens that they're potentially carrying can end up on our doorstep too. So this is no longer a not in my backyard problem. And then, so we heard what the impact from development is, but what's the impact on development? Why should industry care? And actually, there's quite a lot of risks to industry that we've seen. So with SARS, we saw massive market closures. This was the first recorded uh, case, I think, in, in China. Certainly, you know, we've never seen a market closure that I know of from biodiversity risks, you know. So really significant that health was the driver of a market closure. Um, Marburg virus, which is an Ebola-like virus, uh, caused a five-year shutdown of a mining site in Africa. So, you know, major financial impacts to industry, um, impacts on tourism, food production decline. Um, and also, I want to mention with the, the current Ebola crisis in West Africa, we've seen a big focus on um, catastrophic insurance. And, you know, companies are starting to look at how do we finance this and who's held accountable. And typically, um, governments end up being held accountable, financial, uh, you know, World Bank will fund interventions and private donors, but there's not a good accountability mechanism in place. But industry has a really important role to play, and this can be directly beneficial to them. So they can start to look at cost-benefit analysis of projects, and we can develop a mechanism to create eval the evaluation of health-benefiting ecoservices. So what's the health value of a forest? And if we cut it down, what are the financial risks of that? And conversely, what are the financial benefits of pre preserving a forest? Uh, and certainly incorporating health impact assessments into the social and environmental impact assessments, so you have that integrated uh, view of development projects. And then implementing standard practices. So this is something that an, you know, an industry can set as a standard. So providing food for their workers in these remote settings so that they don't have to depend on wildlife hunting for food. And then I'd like to just present this graph because I think it really speaks for itself. You know, it shows that th us that uh, these outbreaks from d uh, animals have resulted in billions of dollars of economic consequences, a lot of different sectors impacted. Um, and recently, actually, the 2015 uh, World Economic Forum mentioned uh, or identified infectious disease spread as, uh, the ma as a major uh, risk in terms of impact for global stability. So we're trying to get you know, beyond this um, control this very reactive approach to emerging diseases and start to forecast outbreaks and intervene early so that we can minimize impact to public health. Um, so I'll just move quickly. But in terms of climate change, so this is something that we can see on the horizon. How is it likely to impact infectious disease and human health? Uh, we've seen from some projections that my colleagues have done that the ecological niche for these uh, reservoir species, so in this case, the flying fox that carries Nipah virus, which we, we know is quite lethal to humans, um, under an even optimistic scenario for climate change with uh, minimal emissions, we're seeing an expanded potential range for this species. So if this species expands, it can carry the pathogen with it, and potentially we'll see more uh, public health threat. And note the red, so this is the expanded range, so note the uh, southwest of the United States, so a concern for us. And of course, um, there would have to be a mechanism to bring this 
you know, species in, but when we think of, you know, invasive species and the risks there, we see there's a potential for the introduction. And just to, to finish by talking about the current Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which has been very tragic to public health. We've seen uh, over 25,000 reported human cases, over 10,000 deaths. And um, I want to make the point that this isn't you know, humans are not the only animal that we've seen Ebola in. Uh, so, sorry, in um, 2003, my colleagues set out to look at declines of uh, chimpanzees and gorillas from a virus, and it was identified as Ebola. And this is causing really widespread mortality of these uh, very endangered species. Um, and Often we've seen actually that mortality events in these species occur prior to human outbreaks, so there's actually a predictive value that we can utilize as a you know, sentinel monitoring benefit. Um, and then the transmission to humans may occur when handling infected wildlife. So this brings many different stakeholders in solving these you know, very uh, important public health crises. So hunters who may be collecting these infected wildlife and have close contact and may find a dead chimpanzee or other great ape and, you know, think it's a sign of, of fortune, you know, it's food security. Uh, but if we can teach them that actually it's, you know, better to leave that and report it to uh, a forester who can then respond, there's a combined solution there. Um, and certainly the coordinated surveillance and laboratory systems are not happening on a large scale in terms of animal health monitoring and human health monitoring, but that's an opportunity where we can bring sectors together and find combined solutions. This is very important because often there are reactive policies which are not science-based when we see an outbreak, and this can be detrimental to wildlife and also worsen the situation for public health. Um, so we want to find a balance between biodiversity and human health and uh, you know, work together to find a One Health solution. Um, and just to finish, I'd like to highlight some benefits of involving other sectors in a One Health approach. So ecologists can help us understand these dimensions of, uh, you know, the ecological changes, what we're seeing, what humans are causing to our ecosystems, and how this is impacting the host species that may carry an emerging pathogen. Um, physicians can help report uh, diseases that are potentially unusual or uh, un undiagnosed and can have a mind for, you know, thinking of an animal link. I think that that's not so appreciated currently. Um, certainly anthropologists can help us to reduce those human transmission risks and find uh, solutions that, you know, still help humans meet their resource demands but in a safer way. And of course many others, and I welcome your ideas on how we might bring in other sectors too. Uh, so with that, I thank you so much, and I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. Uh, I think you've given us a comprehensive and complex, but also clear picture of what's what's going on. I think what strikes us, I think, at World Watch, particularly about your presentation, is that you know, it, it really builds on this idea that you have to understand things in an interdisciplinary way. You can't just look at one particular discipline and say, well, you know, left and right doesn't matter to me what's going on. We have to really understand how everything hangs together. So thank you very much for that. That was, that was great. So let's take, let's take uh, our 10 minutes for questions and answers before we break. Uh, do I see any, any raised arms? Any urgent questions? Bob, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Bob Engelman with World Watch. These presentations have been great, and emerging diseases is, is an interesting one that we haven't dealt with as much as some other ones we have. I was a little amused in your bar graph to see way down at the bottom among the causes of this problem, with a really short little bar, human demographics and behavior, somehow isolated from over-exploitation of land, increases in land use, uh, over-exploitation of wild, uh, wildlife, uh, bushmeat. I'm not quite sure how you can separate human demographics and behavior from all of your long, long bars. And it does occur to me that among the specialists that you might want to engage in discussing emerging diseases and what the trends will be would be demographers, especially given that there is a real uh, dynamism right now in demographic projections of what's going to be happening in the world over this century. There used to be a fair amount of demographic consensus that there would be some kind of leveling off of human population. 
uh, between nine and a half or 10 or 11 billion by the end of the century. That consensus no longer exists. We now, really, it's all up in the air how many human beings will be with us in the for the rest of the century. But it does occur to me to ask, just based on my own work in emerging diseases, it seems to be that the most common factors, that the big factors that links this problem of emerging, new emerging infectious disease is one, the increase in human mobility, not just aviation, but actually even railroads. There was a recent study of HIV that concluded in the very early years of a HIV, it, infection rates seemed to grow with population density, but then jumped when key railroad links were built in across southern Africa. So one is clearly mobility, which not many people call for curbs on. I mean, it's, that's a pretty tough call to say, we need to just become less mobile in the future. And the other, of course, is the increase in human population density, which, again, not many people are willing to say we need to find some way to curb that. Do you think, do you and your colleagues think that in the absence of curbs on mobility and curbs on human population density growth, that there are technological or social or political ways to actually reduce the incidence of new infectious, new emerging infectious diseases? It, yeah, it's a really, it's a great point. Um, and I, I just want to start out first by addressing your first point about the demographics. So those, that bar chart, those lines, they're not mutually exclusive. I should have mentioned that. And you're absolutely right that demographic, you know, it, they all overlap in, in some way or another. Um, so thank you for that point. Um, in terms of, of your second point, I, it's well taken. Um, I think what we've seen in the past has been quite different than what we're seeing now. So Ebola, the first known outbreak was in 1976, and those tended to, you know, kind of go under the radar. There would be an outbreak. It would uh, be typically limited to one remote village. It wouldn't have a large extent of spread. It would kind of, you know, die out. Um, now with increasing mobility, we're seeing just such a potential for spread. So, you know, it, it's letting these diseases manifest in a much different way so that they can, uh, you know, grow in incidence and, and spread. And um, I think there's been a large focus on vaccination, you know, and other therapies for Ebola. Um, it's an important part of the public health discussion, but if we can get to the actual source and prevent it, I think that's all the more powerful. And we haven't been investing resources at that level. It's really reactive. You know, once an outbreak occurs, then we try to curb it. But I think there's a lot we can do so that those outbreaks never occur. And that's really the, the end goal here. Sorry, I'm, I'm not doing my job. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm still waiting for you to say more, Sorry. and I'm not paying attention. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Abby Rome. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about one of the specific things you said um, about the um, use of antibiotics in farm animals. Um, if I heard you, you said that the, the link between the, the overuse and misuse of antibiotics in farm animals um, is, has not been made to um, the, the detriments to human health. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit more and how if, it, if that is true, then how important is it to make that link to affect policy and to reduce the use of antibiotics in farm animals? Thank you. Yeah, it's a tricky issue. I, I think um, the focus on clinical medicine has been really because the link is very clear. So you have a hospital acquired infection and it's you know diagnosed as resistant and that link is, is very easy to make. Um, but when you have potentially many sources of antibiotics in your food sources, in the soil, and, you know, it just so much uh, dispersion, and we, we can't always make that link of where it came from. It may be changing our susceptibility, which, which then makes us more susceptible to a hospital-acquired infection. So it's not a linear pathway, and I think that's what makes it quite challenging. Um, there's a, a increasing amount of literature on it. I don't think that research is really focusing on the three-fourths that are going towards uh, the use in veterinary medicine, but I think it needs to go in that direction. So thank you for your point. Okay, do we have other questions? Yes, all the way in the back, on, the on my left. Um, what do you think 
uh, within the U.S. the government and even individuals can do? Um, and what do you think are the like most pressing emerging diseases within the country? Well, I think it, it this is a public health problem. I think we can um, at many levels intervene. So certainly encourage our policymakers and our agencies. I'm really thrilled that we have someone from the EPA here, and hopefully some other agency representatives, um, but we can encourage them to work in a multidisciplinary approach, so not just sticking to their professional silos, but uh, working you know, among health, environment, bringing in the financial sector. You know, it, It's so opportune to bring these different uh, sectors together and find new innovative solutions. On a consumer level, we can certainly choose foods that uh, are produced without antibiotics. We can prioritize that, you know, vote with our money. Um, and I saw really encouraging news that McDonald's is actually phasing out use of antibiotics, I think, in poultry. Um, so that's a very big force on the market that's going to encourage, hopefully, other producers to go in that same direction. But that's a result of public pressure. So the more pressure we can place, um, you know, I think the more reward we'll see. Thank you. Good question. Great. I think we have time for one more question. And somebody on my right, all the way in the back, had raised hers or her hand. I only saw a hand real quick, but no. Is that no longer the case? No. Well, I'll, if nobody else wants to ask a question, I think I will ask one. Um, you had referred to, I guess, what often is called factory farming, intensified industrialized livestock operations. And I'm, I sort of end up wondering, you know, can we do factory farming you know, a little better, or does it just have to be eventually abandoned? I mean, do, are we doing ourselves in by pursuing these, these industrialized operations? Yeah, it's a, it's a good and challenging question. I think in some ways there's benefits, because if you have you know, a dedicated area for food production that's very efficient, then you don't have to utilize other, you know, you don't have to convert other land for those purposes. So I think there's benefit there and, you know, scaling up production and not having to um, utilize pristine forest elsewhere for it. Uh, I think it has to be paired with very strong biosecurity. So there has to be monitoring and something like the the tracking of antibiotic resistance development needs to be incorporated into that. Currently, the surveillance is not there. Um, I think there are ways to do it well, but we, we're not doing that on an industry level, and we're not holding industry accountable for it either. So I, I think there's potential for it, but um, we would need a lot of massive changes to do it well. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for both your presentation and really wonderful answers to the questions.